Um, we're welcome to the February 5th meeting of the Cannabis Licensing and Advisory Board for the City of Boulder. And um, let's go ahead and start with the instructions for a virtual meeting and rules of decorum. Thank you. Good afternoon. The information is for public participation at Beverage Licensing Authority and Cannabis Licensing Advisory meetings. The city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and board and commission members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. More about this vision and the project's community engagement process can be found at the link shown on your screen. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during the meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to sign up to speak using the name they are commonly known by, and individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. For the public, currently only audio testimony is permitted online. Would you like to go ahead and do roll call? No. Certainly. Before you start, um, as I mentioned, Robin Noble Gribben will be joining us hopefully within the next uh, six or seven minutes. And then, Brian, do you want me to state the reality or do you want to state it yourself? Oh, I just wanted to share that. I'm on day four of COVID, so I might be kind of in and out. So, but hang it in there. It's, you have the nice pillow effect behind you. Okay. So, Kristen, given that. Member Christie. Present. Sorry. Member Daniel. Present. Member Green. Here. Vice Chair Keegan. Present. Chair Kunzman. Present. And it was noted that Member Noble will be arriving late. Ex officio member Thompson. Present. Thank you. We have a quorum. Okay. Um, do you want to introduce the other people in the virtual room first, or do you want to go on to the approval of the two sets of minutes? Certainly, I can do the introductions. Um, I will let them um, speak uh, if they choose to. From the city attorney's office, we have the new deputy city attorney, Roberto Ramirez. Mr. Ramirez, would you like to make any comment to the board? Good afternoon. Um, happy to be joining you. Thank you. And from the city regulatory licensing division, we have our city licensing, one of our city licensing specialists, Sabrina Ragna. Sabrina? Hey, everyone. She's going to be shadowing me over the next several months on CLAB activities and processes and procedures. So you'll be um, seeing things come across from her um, in the next coming months. Okay, welcome to both of you and um, thanks for joining us. And you, let's go ahead and look at the minutes from the December 4th and the January 8th meeting. Any um, cause for concern, any corrections? And if not, let's vote on each one separately. I'll, I'll take a motion for December minutes. Brian, motions to approve the December minutes. Okay, any second on that? Ethan seconds. That's Ethan. Ethan, your microphone is very 
distant, by the way. <clears throat> um, all, you want to do a hand vote, Kristen, or just a I or nay? An I or nay would be a... Okay, anyone okay. opposed or abstaining? Okay, and the eyes will have it. And then a motion for the January minutes, if no one has any concerns. Ryan, motions to approve the January minutes. And second on that. Ethan seconds. That's better. <laughs> Got to lean in. Uh, any uh, anyone opposed or abstaining? And the eyes have it. Um, let's go on to general public comments for the board. Do we have Good any? Up. We do have attendees in our waiting room. So if you would like to make public comment during this time for the board, please use the raise your hand feature located in your meeting link webpage at the moment. Comments will be uh, restricted to three minutes per speaker. Is there anyone for general public comment? Last call, general public comment for the Cannabis Licensing and Advisory Board. Chair Kunzman, I'm not seeing any hands raised. We can close okay. the general public comment section. Okay. There, there is one item I would like to note. Um, we did receive last month a resignation for ex officio member Bailey. It was in time to be include for her seat to be included in the board recruitment, which we will talk about uh, further in the agenda under regulatory licensing matters. Okay, next on the published agendas, uh, matters from the cannabis enforcement officer, but Pam, are you gonna be able to stay a little bit on today that we could go with the MBD folks first? Because I suspect Robin would like to be here for your moment in the sun. Would help if I unmute my microphone. Yes, that would be fine. Okay, and of course, obviously you, you can stay and ask questions of MED too. Um, so They're tired of me asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't told us that yet. All right, then let's go on to agenda item number four and save three for a moment. Uh, presentation from the MED, Marijuana Enforcement Division. Do you folks want to introduce yourselves? Sure. Um, I'll just kick us off here. My name is Chris Poirier. I'm the Deputy Director of Policy and Regulatory Affairs at the division. Um, joining me today are the investigators from our Longmont Field Office, which oversees Boulder as part of their area of responsibility, obviously. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Keith so the team can introduce themselves. Good afternoon, board members. My name is Keith Kredich. I'm the agent in charge at the MED. I oversee both uh, Longmont, which is northern Colorado, and the Lakewood Field Offices, which uh, covers the metro Denver area. So with that, I'll pass it on to Supervisor uh, Slegel. I'm Supervisor Criminal Investigator Melissa Slegel. Um, you've probably seen me out at some of the businesses in around the area. And I supervise in our Longmont office. And on our team, we have our compliance investigator, Michelle Sebastian, and a criminal investigator, um, Alexander Thompson. So hopefully they can, can come on camera and at least show their faces so you see who they are. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Michelle Sebastian, compliance investigator out of the Longmont field office. All right. Um, Is Alexandra, excuse me, did she join um, without an MED attachment to her name? I have an Alexandra in the waiting room, I'm going to admit. That would be her. It says that she didn't get it approved. Oh, I, yeah, I just said Alexandra. We, uh, I thought might she might just be a um, 
uh, a public attendee. Okay, she should be able to. Um, there we Hi, go. Hi, everybody. I'm Alexandra. I'm a criminal investigator out of the Longmont office as well. I apologize. I didn't attach MD to my name, so I made it a little bit more difficult. <laughs> That's all right. Perfectly fine. Thanks. Right. With that, if it's all right, we can go ahead and kick off our presentation. Um, Keith, would you be able to share your screen? All right, and I can see it if you're able to get into presentation mode. All right, so today we're going to provide an overview of some of the rules that went into effect on January 8th of uh, this year. There will be some new and revised rules which we won't be covering in our presentation today. However, if at any time after today's presentation, you come across a rule or a rule change that you would like additional clarity on, don't hesitate to reach out to us or submit a question on our website using the MED inquiry form. We're always happy to help. Also, as we move through this presentation, if at any time you have a question, please raise your hand or speak up. Um, we don't need to wait until the end for questions. Um, so yeah, as regards our new and revised rules, the first item you probably noticed is that the effective date was January 8th instead of January 1st, which is historically when our new rules go into effect. Um, this was in response to stakeholder comments um, about the difficulty of implementing rules on January 1, a day in which the division offices are closed and no one's available to assist with uh, any questions. So this year we uh, started that on January 8th. So we're gonna start our presentation today by covering the implementation of Senate Bill 271. The bill has three main components that required rule changes. First, it classifies hemp-derived and marijuana-derived cannabinoids into three classifications, non-intoxicating, potentially intoxicating, and intoxicating cannabinoids. It also allows for a cultivation facility to bring in seeds, immature plants, and genetic material from outside um, entities and licensed individuals. And finally, the bill authorizes the state licensing authority to promulgate rules, either allowing or prohibiting the production of synthetic cannabinoids. And this bill affected multiple rule series, um, the 100, 300, 400, 500, 600 series. It was uh, pretty expansive. Um, so with that, we will go ahead and dive into the rules. Um, so with rule 3-110, Keith, I think you need to hit it um, one more, a few more times. Um, so jumping into the rules with Rule 3110D, um, some context here. So Senate Bill 271 included what's called a safe harbor provision. Um, this allows hemp-derived product manufacturers located in Colorado to manufacture hemp-derived products that would not be permitted for sale in our state, but can be exported to a state that does not prohibit their sale. So the passing of this bill, the MED wanted to ensure clarity of our rules. So rule 3110D states, a regulated marijuana business may not possess or transfer safe harbor hemp products. Next is rule 3105D4. Uh, this rule added requirements for labeling of genetic material prior to, to the transfer to another regulated marijuana business, such that it must contain at least the license number of the transfer and cultivation. So rule 3810A2, this added genetic material to the minimum tracking requirements, inventory tracking requirements. Um, so any genetic material received must be immediately entered into the state inventory tracking system as an immature plant batch. Um, and 3825C3, similarly, um, this adds a requirement that testing facilities must enter all transfers of genetic material into the inventory tracking system. Rule 3-905B33. This identifies what information is required to be obtained by the licensee for source genetic material. Uh, the name, address, license, registration, or permit identification of the party supplying the genetic material, all certificates of analysis, if available, and all records that document the chain of custody, how it came into the uh, regulated um, sector. 
So rule 3-335G.5, this rule relates to the production of semi-synthetic cannabinoids. It specifies that only research and development licenses may manufacture semi-synthetic cannabinoids, and that no licensees can manufacture, produce, possess, or transfer synthetic cannabinoids. So synthetics, completely banned, um, and only research and development can produce semi-synthetic cannabinoids. So rules um, 5205, 6205, 6705, and 6705. Um, these allow medical or retail cultivation facilities or an accelerated cultivator to transfer immature plants, seeds, and genetic material to any other cultivation facility. Next slide, thank you. Um, rule 6405H, similarly, this rule now allows a testing facility to transfer immature plants, seeds, and genetic material to another cultivation facility. Additionally, importantly here, the rule makes it a conflict of interest for a testing facility to perform testing for another facility that it has transferred immature plants, seeds, or genetic material to. So rules 5205G2 and 6205H. So these two rule changes are significant. Um, these allow medical and retail cultivation facilities to obtain immature plants, seeds, and genetic material, as we've been talking about, from another licensed facility operating outside of the jurisdiction of Colorado or from an employee licensee. They cannot, however, obtain any of these uh, items internationally. So, and there is a push for that to be expanded. We did hear from stakeholders wanting to allow for um, seeds, immature plants, genetic materials to come in from another country, um, but that's, that's not where we landed on this one. So one last thing before we dive into some of the other final adopted rules, Senate Bill 271 also requires the division to submit a report to the General Assembly analyzing the feasibility of establishing a standing committee that would evaluate cannabinoids and cannabis-derived products for the purpose of determining and making recommendations regarding their safety profiles and their potential for intoxication. Um, we've already started that process of developing that report. We are anticipating having two public stakeholder meetings in March, um, specifically regarding this report. We haven't announced it yet, but um, intend to send that announcement out this week. So if you are interested, please keep your eye out. If you haven't signed up for our email list, um, I'd encourage you to head to our website and do so. And with that, I will turn it over to Melissa. Thanks, Chris. So with our final adopted rules section, we did not include um, we did not include part one in our rule review today. However, we would like to point out there have been several new definitions or clarifications to definitions in this rulemaking session. We added the following definitions for genetic material, hemp, hemp product, intoxicating cannabinoid, microbial control step, notice of destruction, notice of embargo, safe harbor hemp product, semi-synthetic cannabinoid, and synthetic, synthetic cannabinoid. We clarified the following definitions. Yes. Well, well, hold on one second. Kate has got her hand up. It was... uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you could briefly um, explain the difference between the synthetic versus the semi-synthetic cannabinoids to the to the board, just so we understand a little bit more about, is that possible? I'm going to jump in uh, on Melissa's behalf. I We have a couple staff scientists who definitely would be able to explain that. Um, I don't think right now any of us would be in a good place to, but we could certainly follow up um, with the board if that's possible via email. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be interested to, to know um, to mo know more about that. We'll definitely get that over then. Thanks for jumping in. I couldn't see hands and stuff. Um, so we also clarified the following definitions, adverse health event to include an unexpected health condition, decontamination to indicate following a failed test, employee license to remove references to key licenses and support licenses, remediation to indicate following a failed test, and retail marijuana removed industrial from the definition. Rule 2-245C2, 
This rule was clarified regarding when a change is exempt from a change of owner notification needs to be filed. All changes require notification except when the change is due to a change in passive beneficial ownership. Rule 2-245C4, rule was clarified to notify the MED within 45 days of the removal of any executive officers or board members. Previously, we had a time requirement to notify of an addition of an executive officer or board member, but not the removal. Rule 2-275A2, this rule was clarified to allow a temporary appointee to file either a request for finding of suitability or if they have already been found suitable, a change of ownership application. This change may not necessarily change the current practices, but just makes it more express in rule. And we're gonna go back to you, Chris. Thanks, Melissa. And before we move forward with the presentation, even though I don't think I'm equipped to elaborate on it, um, I did want to read the definitions for synthetic and semi-synthetic. Um, so a semi-synthetic cannabinoid means a substance that is created by a chemical reaction that converts one cannabinoid extracted from a cannabis plant directly into a different cannab cannabinoid. Um, it includes cannabinoids such as CBN um, that was produced by the conversion of CBD. And semi-synthetic cannabinoid does not include cannabinoids produced via decarboxylation of naturally occurring acidic forms of cannabinoids, such as um, tetrahydrocannabinolic acid into the corresponding neutral cannabinoids such as THC through the use of heat or light without the use of chemical reagents or catalysts and it results in no other chemical change. Um, and as for synthetic cannabinoids, that is a cannabinoid-like compound that was produced by using chemical synthesis, chemical modification or chemical conversion, including by using in vitro biosynthesis or other bioconversion of such a method. It does not include a compound produced through the decarboxylation of naturally occurring cannabinoids from their acidic forms. And it also does not include naturally semi-synthetic cannabinoids. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, but with that, we will go ahead and continue with our presentation. Um, so rule 3110C here. Um, this rule clarifies that natural medicine is prohibited. They cannot be transferred on a licensed premises or in a vehicle. Additionally, any of our business licensees cannot also hold natural medicine license. This arose from a stakeholder request for clarity um, on specifically natural medicine. Some stakeholders found it duplicative as we already have the ban on non-marijuana consumables in retail stores, um, but responding to that uh, request for clarity, we thought that would be helpful and included it. So rule 3-225B4. So some of the next series of rules that we're going to talk about are, arise from our attempt to find rule efficiencies um, for industry stakeholders. Um, this last summer, we went through a fee evaluation resulting in new fee rules that um, did raise the fees. Uh, and obviously the industry is kind of in a struggling place right now. Economic environment is not great. Um, so what we wanted to do is find rule efficiencies that maybe could reduce some of that burden. Um, so this rule specifically, um, Video surveillance backup battery requirements were reduced from four hours to two hours. And for video surveillance, rule 3-225, um, the retention period has been decreased from 40 days to 30 days. This may change, this change may require investigators to request video surveillance tapes sooner than they did previously, um, but otherwise not a big burden on the division. Going to rule 3-320, next slide. So these rule changes arose out of the science and policy work groups recommendations. Um, we now have the microbial control step, which is a defined term now, um, and it's a regulated process now. So this is where a business treats all of its flour after harvest, but prior to sending it for testing. So this was already occurring and it wasn't against the rules, but now we've kind of regulated this step um, and put some guardrails in here. So these six methods right here that you can see on the screen are the only approved methods for microbial control steps and decontamination at this time. Um, the licensees do have the ability to request that the division approve other methods, but for now, these are the six that are outlined in rule and approved. 
So this rule 3-320C and E also came out of a science and policy work group recommendation. Um, C specifies safety measures that must be taken when using a microbial control step or decontamination. And E provides an avenue for stakeholders to request a new method as discussed um, for microbial control step and decontamination uh, to be considered for approval by the division. Rule 3-320D, also science and policy work group recommendation. So this rule now requires that decontamination method used, whatever decontamination method is used, must be documented in metric for packages that have been decontaminated. Um, for those who don't know, decontamination is the neutralization or removal of dangerous substances or other contaminants from the marijuana without changing the product type, as opposed to remediation, which also neutralizes or removes dangerous substances, but does change the product type. And I see we have a question or comment. Hi there. Yeah, just a question on this de de decontamination sort of being connected into metric. Would this kind of notice or flag ever kind of a appear to the end consumer? Like if you were buying a product, would it say that this product was decontaminated by this method or that wouldn't appear to the consumer? Good question. And we'll actually get to that on a future slide. All right. Thanks. Um, here we go. So 3-325B, we did clarify rule adding that in the production of regulated marijuana, this is prohibited chemicals. Um, we added this clarification because um, you know the, these chemicals can be introduced uh, at manufacturer licenses as well as at clean cultivations. Um, and additionally, we added regulated marijuana products and hemp products on which any of the prohibited chemicals is detected is a violation of the rule. Rule 3-330D1B. This was also a science and policy work group recommendation. This added standard operating procedure requirements for decontamination and microbial control step methods. Rule 3-335D2D. This was an external suggestion um, that we received from stakeholders. So based on stakeholder feedback on soft confections and the requirement for the universal symbol to be stamped on them, Often soft confection products lose their shape, rendering the universal symbol unrecognizable. I know we had come across this in many of our investigations. It's a very uh, tough thing to do with these types of products. So what we've done is we've allowed for the printing of the universal symbol on the individual wrapper of the product for soft confections, as opposed to requiring it being stamped with the universal symbol. Rule 3-805. This removes the reference to RFID and replaces it with inventory tracking system. So this is an initial step to broaden our competitive solicitation process for a new contract in the future for the inventory tracking system. However, we do wanna be very clear because there has been some confusion on this. Um, the change in language throughout the revised rules eliminating the references to RFID does not remove the current requirement for RFID tags. Obviously that is all metric still will provide. The reason for that is the Department of Revenue and Metric are currently under contract until October of 2026, and the terms of the contract do include RFID inventory tracking tags. So rule 3-805D2, this also came from an external suggestion. So the rule has been revised to require that plants um, need to be tagged once they reach 15 inches tall or 15 inches wide as opposed to the previous requirement of eight inches tall or eight inches wide. However, with that said, the immature plant is still defined in statute. So an immature plant is still one that is eight inches tall or eight inches wide and will need to be accounted for in the inventory tracking system in accordance with our rules. Even though it does not yet need to be individually tagged, it needs to be individually tagged once it reaches 15 inches tall or wide. So rule 3905A2 and 3905B, these are more rule efficiency changes. Um, so we looked at our record retention requirements did a review of those rules. And so these new rules are gonna require the majority of records to be kept for the current year and the previous year, with a few exceptions that we will cover on the next slide. So in 3905B.5, um, we did add a section for records required for three years, uh, partially required by statute, for example, tax documents, um, 
and books and records sufficient to show fully the business transactions of each licensee. Those arise from uh, statute, but all of these are records that through our process determined did need a longer requirement than the current year and previous year. So rule 3920D, this adds that a licensee must report a fire on a licensed premises to the rule. Um, this came about actually from a local licensing authority who had a licensee failed to not only call the fire department, but also failed to contact the local licensing authority. Failure to notify can be problematic because we want to ensure that the consumer, we want to ensure the consumer safety of any marijuana on the premises is good, as well as ensure the integrity and security of the facility. So this was a, a loophole that I don't think had been contemplated until that situation came up, but now it is a requirement to rule. So rule 3.10.15e. This is a new rule that was deemed necessary after making changes to decontamination and adding microbial control step methods. Um, kind of going back to the discussion earlier. So this rule is going to require decontaminated products to have a division approved label beginning on July 1st, 2025 for consumer awareness. Um, we're going to be working with stakeholders in the future to help the division um, with the design of this decontamination label. Um, so that's something that will be in process, um, but the extended date is to give us time to work through that, and uh, and then that requirement will be going into effect. Um, and so with that, I will turn it back to Melissa. Having some problems with my mouse now. Um, Thanks, Chris. So rule 4-120B6, this also came from the science and policy work group, as many others did. It specifies the fee required to, util to utilize reduced testing allowance, or RTA, which becomes effective January 8th, 2024. In addition, the licensee is required to provide an attestation form with the fee. Note, this attestation form and fee are license specific. A separate attestation or fee is not required for each contamination test type and is required every 12 months. This new fee is to address the additional division resources that are used due to the compliance issues related to RTA. I just want to note here that the division has extended the deadline for submission of the attestation form and fee to February 29th, 2024. Rule 4-120B1B, another one from the Science and Policy Work Group. This rule outlines the parameters of how a licensee may achieve RTA for microbial contamination testing if the licensee has a hazard analysis and critical control point or HACCP system containing elements defined in ASTM, that, that one's written on the slide for you, D8250-19. So the ASTM is a standard practice for cleaning and disinfection at a marijuana cultivation facility. The rule revisions draw on the principles of the HACCP, which is a system designed to identify and mitigate sources of contamination before contamination occurs. HACCP is required by the FDA and USDA in meat and juice production, is utilized throughout the food industry, and the principles of HACCP are applied even more broadly across industries. This rule goes into effect on July 1st, 2024. As part of the implementation aspect of this rule, we are working with ASTM to provide a copy of the manual for public inspection at each of the MED offices. Rule 4-120B1, um, additional science and policy work group this rule was revised to ensure all harvest batches are cultivated and processed in the same manner to be eligible to obtain and maintain a reduced testing allowance, including the same growth media, lighting, pesticides, drying, trimming, and packaging procedures. Rule 4-120B1C, another science and policy work group, to achieve RTA for microbial contaminants, a cultivation facility must conduct an internal audit to assess that they are in substantial compliance. This internal audit will be performed and scored per the rubric listed in rule 4-120B1BI, the little one. 
This rule also goes into effect on July 1st, 2024. Rule 4-120F3. Rule was added to address reauthorization of RTA after a failed internal audit or a failed MED inspection. If a cultivation facility fails, then the licensee must correct the identified deficiencies, complete a new internal audit, complete a new attestation form, and follow reauthorization procedures. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back over to Chris. All right, rule 6-105B.5. Um, this allows retail marijuana stores to transfer retail marijuana to other retail marijuana businesses. This was actually an oversight in our rules that was brought to our attention. Um, you couldn't transfer uh, product from one store, one retail store to another. Um, and, you know, an example that someone had reached out that multiple stores needed to shift inventory around because one was, you know, being very successful. The other one was kind of slow. Um, so we made sure to uh, modify the rules to allow for that. Rule 6-925G. So this was an external suggestion um, regarding our hospitality rules. So for the hospitality licenses, daily sales summits have been increased, uh, which will create a parity between the hospitality and sales licenses and the hospitality licenses, which a consumer can bring the entire daily sales limit for them to consume on site. This will also bring consistency between retail stores and hospitality licenses. They're not identical. Um, the concentrate limit is lower for the hospitality and sales business than a retail store um, based on stakeholder feedback, but the flower and uh, edible limits are the same. So 6-925B, um, this was another external suggestion. Um, so we've added a requirement to rule that at least a portion of the product someone purchases at a hospitality and sales license must be consumed on site. Um, this is just to ensure that hospitality and sales businesses don't also become another form of retail stores. Rule 6-925H1, another external suggestion. So we clarified the rule to require that the licensee's standard operating procedures include a process to ensure the consumer does not exceed the sales limitation and provisions for sharing of retail marijuana. And rule 6-905Q, another external suggestion. Um, so this is a new requirement so that licensed hospitality businesses have to provide consumers with information regarding safe transportation, uh, which also must be reflected in their standard operating procedures. After hearing a lot of feedback regarding the various methods that licensees might want to utilize for providing information, including pamphlets, QR codes, flyers, um, we didn't take the step of mandating how a licensee must provide the information about safe transportation, just that they do so and that it's reflected in their standard operating procedures. At this time, we're exploring how the division can maybe support this requirement by providing examples or guidance, um, but that's something you know we're working on for in the future. So rule 6-925B.5, we added the tangible educational resource requirements to the hospitality and sales businesses to align them um, with retail and medical marijuana stores. So if someone's purchasing concentrate, the, the hospitality and sales business will be required to provide them with a tangible educational resource. Um, and that, that resource came out of House Bill 21-13-17. All right, next, um, this was also a stakeholder suggestion. We had a stakeholder reach out uh, wanting to open a spa, a spa hospitality and sales license. And after kind of reviewing the rules and working through it with the, uh, the potential applicant, we didn't really see a way, a path forward for that model. Um, so through our rulemaking session here, and uh, Tom, I'll get to you right after this, if that works. Um, no problem. So, so we're introducing the spa business model here. And um, we'll go through some of the changes that allow for that. But, uh, but yeah, this, this came out of a stakeholder request. Tom. Um, on the previous slide, Now, I'm only reading the summary of House Bill 21, 13, 17, but it doesn't go into much detail of the tangible educational resource. Is there more is, in the, is there more comprehensive uh, description of what that is? Yeah, so the tangible educational resource is, um, well, obviously mandated by uh, 13, 17. 
the, uh, the division developed the tangible educational resource and it's available on our website for licensees. Um, so it's, it's the same resource for everyone across the board. Um, and like I said, retail and medical marijuana stores have been handing it out now for a couple of years. Okay, thank you. Um, so going on to rule 6-926B, next slide. So under these new spa rules, um, massage therapists must be licensed not only by the MED, but also by the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Um, this was something that was discussed by stakeholders during rulemaking, but um, you know, ensuring that we have people over the age of 21 and that we have the, you know, the line of sight to employees on a licensed premises, we did land that the uh, massage therapist would need to be licensed by the MED as well. Um, yeah, and just to make sure, you know, we've got that line of sight and that regulatory hook. On, Tom. And just, on several of the things, I wish I could see the comparison of what was before versus now. So I'm assuming on that last issue that massage therapists, if they were going to work in a hospitality or spa business, then... So previously our rules... Our rules didn't really complement this or consider this business model um, when we introduced the hospitality and sales licenses. So there was no discussion of massage therapists um, previous to this rulemaking session because it just wasn't contemplated. So um, if someone had attempted to open a spa or salon type business previously, since the massage therapist would be working as an employee of the business, they still would have had to been licensed. So, Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, and, and just for information, some of the requirements that made this not feasible, um, the big one was video surveillance. Um, obviously, people getting massages, that kind of conflicts with, um, you know, doors rules or, or massage therapist rules on that. So that's kind of what, that was the impetus for addressing this through rule. So moving on to rule 6-930B and B2. Um, so to allow for this business model, we clarified the rule by removing the requirement for a consumer to consume in a restricted access area. Um, and this also allows a massage therapist to apply topical product. So this is part of that, um, having a space where the product could be consumed in the form of an application of topicals without being under video surveillance. So rule 6926C does address the video surveillance directly. So under this new rule, consumption areas for massage services are not required to be under video surveillance. However, all points of ingress and egress to those rooms must be under video surveillance. And additionally, no additional consumption is allowed within the massage services rooms, strictly the application of topical products. Um, no smoking in those rooms, no consumption of edibles or anything like that. So rules 6-940C.5 and 2260D2. Um, this was a, another external suggestion from stakeholders moving on from spa concepts. Um, so for right now, for our hospitality licensees who have a, a mobile premises, um, previously they were required to get a PUC permit um, before they submitted their application, their initial application. And that was very difficult for some of them. There was a little bit of a chicken egg thing going on with PUC. Um, so what we've done, we've revised the rule now so that they must receive the PUC permit prior to becoming operational. Um, and this mirrors some other requirements in our rules, for example, um, for delivery licensees or for hospitality licensees, they also have to go through responsible vendor training, um, but we don't require that at the time of application, we just require prior to operation. Right, so we're going to finish today by going over House Bill 1021 um, and the rule changes that arose from that. So this bill, it clarifies the authority for the division to issue an administrative hold on the movement of medical or retail marijuana pending an investigation into alleged violations of the code or rules. Um, and it further authorizes an embargo of regulated marijuana when there are objective and reasonable grounds to believe that the health, safety, or welfare of the public imperatively requires emergency action. Um, and the bill also allows for an order of destruction of embargo of regulated marijuana after notice and an opportunity for hearing. Hey, Chris. Yes. Um, sorry, I've just been deliberating 
about something a few slides ago. Um, it was part six, rule six nine twenty six D. Yes. One more back, I think. Do you know what the what? I know this is primarily about video surveillance, but do you know what the thinking was to not allow additional consumption in the massage service rooms? Um, I think we wanted to be consistent with how we're currently treating um, hospitality and sales licensees and hospitality licensees, as well as, um, or just hospitality and sales licensees, sorry. But being consistent with that in our previous rule that consumption of, um, you know, edibles, flour, vapes, et cetera, concentrate um, occurs in a restricted access area and restricted access areas are required to be under video surveillance. That way that helps us if, for example, we had um, an underage sale at a hospitality and sales license. We would have mm -hmm. the, the video evidence of that. Um, so having that on video, um, like I said, it's consistent. It helps um, for our regulations. Having it in the spa room, obviously a conflict, but that's why no additional um, consumption in there. That said, there's nothing against someone consuming in the restricted access area before their massage. Okay, thank you. So back to House Bill 1021, um, we're gonna start with rule 8110B.5. Um, so this is our embargo section and it's pretty similar to our administrative hold paragraph, um, which we'll go over next. But this is split into three parts. There's the notice of embargo, the effects of embargo, and the release or destruction of regulated marijuana subject to embargo. So directly from the bill language, the division can embargo regulated marijuana when quote, there are objective and reasonable grounds to believe that the health, safety, or welfare of the public imperatively requires emergency action. So similar to the process for administrative holds, a division investigator may issue a notice of embargo, identifying which regulated marijuana is subject to the embargo, and the senior director will issue a concise statement afterwards that includes the reason or reasons for the embargo. While subject to embargo, the regulated marijuana in question must be physically segregated and safeguarded. It can't be transferred or transported. It can, however, be destroyed with advance approval from the division and in coordination with the division. Um, and I just want to pause here and talk a little bit about the embargo tool. This is really helpful for us because, you know, we've had cases where a rule violation did not occur, or at least we had no indication that a rule violation had occurred, but the product was dangerous. Say it was uh, had something in it that wasn't contemplated under our rules at the time. Um, and I know we usually point back to the Ebola crisis where people were getting sick from vapes, people were dying, um, and it was due to a specific ingredient, something that our rules didn't cover. Uh, fortunately, in the state of Colorado, we didn't have any reported deaths, and we did implement some emergency rules as quickly as we could to make sure those products were off the shelves. Um, but this now gives us the ability to put those products on hold while we work through it to mitigate any ongoing or future harm and remove them from the stream of commerce. Um, Ryan. So would this just be embargoing marijuana products? So I'm thinking of an example where let's say a pesticide is sort of discovered to be like a risk to consumers. Would you be embargoing the pesticides or would you be embargoing the like marijuana products that were treated with the pesticide? So we would be embargoing the products treated with the pesticide. Um, this is pretty similar to an administrative hold. The difference as, as we'll walk through it is that the embargo is focused on there's a threat to public health and safety. And the administrative hold is focused on we're investigating a violation and we need to preserve this marijuana while we conduct our investigation. Um, and the embargo- Can you follow up, what would that, um, as that's written, like how would that determination be made? Is that just an agency determination that like this is a public health risk or that would that come through some other kind of agency determination? Yeah, that that would be an agency determination. Um, if, if we wanted to place something under embargo or if we wanted to place something on administrative hold, it really depends on the facts and circumstances of the specific situation. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, the only other thing I was gonna add is embargo is a tool that the Department of Public Health and Environment has had for some time and used with much success to make sure that you know we only have safe products on, on store shelves. Um, so with that, we'll move on to rule 8-110B, also from House Bill 1021. Um, and this one's all about the administrative holds. So B1A clarifies that administrative holds are used to prevent the destruction of evidence, diversion, or other threats to public safety, 
pending an investigation of an alleged violation of the code or rules. And B1B expands the concise statement issued to a licensee. Um, for anyone not familiar, after we place a product on administrative hold, we follow that up with a concise statement that outlines the reasons for the hold. Um, so we expanded the concise statement. And in addition to explaining the reasons for the hold, we're adding an estimated time frame for the investigation to be complete. Uh, with that said, if the time frame is adjusted um, for what you know, different changing circumstances as the investigation proceeds, the division must provide the licensee with written notice of the extension of the estimated time frame. It's rule 8-110B2E, also from House Bill 1021. So this covers the effects um, of an administrative hold. They're the same as currently outlined in rule without substantive changes, except that B2E explicitly gives the licensee authority to destroy marijuana on hold. If there is no longer a need to preserve evidence with advance approval from and in coordination with the division. This was generally already our practice, um, but this just makes it more explicit and outlines it. So 8110B3, this covers how an administrative hold can end. Um, so these include the state licensing authority or the investigator lifting the hold. Um, it could be by agreement through the state licensing authority and the licensee to lift it, perhaps pursuant to a settlement, um, or it could be by expiration after 120 days. So this requirement was not previously in rule, um, but now we have put an expiration date on an administrative hold of 120 days from the time of the hold being placed unless the hold is extended by the state licensing authority. Such an order to extend will identify the reasons for the extension and B3D on the next slide here covers the factors that the state licensing authority must consider when deciding to extend. Um, again, the need to preserve evidence, existence of new or continued threat of diversion, uh, failure to cooperate with division investigators, failure to maintain security and inventory controls, including record keeping, video surveillance, et cetera, uh, failure to maintain all state or uh, local required licenses, and the licensee's current tax non-compliance. So if an administrative hold is going to be extended past the 120 days, the state licensing authority has to take these factors into consideration and identify the reasons for the extension. So slide 50, or sorry, rule 8220B4. Um, this is more procedural. Um, if we issue a notice of destruction on an embargo, that is obviously subject to a hearing before a, a hearings officer. So what we've done is kind of made it similar to our other uh, procedures for requesting hearings. Must be made within 60 days of service, must be submitted by mail or hand delivered. Um, and if a licensee receives a notice of destruction for embargo marijuana, and also has a pending administrative action, uh, the licensee will have one hearing scheduled with the hearings division just to consolidate resources and make that easier for all parties involved. So those are all of the rule updates that we have today. Tried to keep it um, under an hour. Um, are there any questions? Yes, ahead, Brian. Brian. Yeah, I guess this is uh, not related to the presentation you had, um, but it's maybe a $420,000 question relating to just the contingencies that the MED has, if there's any kind of rescheduling or descheduling that happens at the federal level, and what kinds of considerations, if that scenario played out, that you have in mind as a, as a and like how that might trickle down to local constituencies like us. Yeah, I don't really have anything at this time I think I can share on that, um, but I can say that it's definitely something we're looking at and working on recognizing that that may be a consideration in the near future. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, um, thank you all for having us today um, and hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Well, Chris, before you go, uh, so we were holding off on approving a policy request form because it, it was um, uh, singular and just one little part of what you discussed in uh, in your slides. Um, it has to do, I'm trying to pull it up here. Um, it's it's uh, the amount of time to save video 
uh, files from I'm fabric. I can't find it right now, but I remember yeah, it's the surveillance days, requirement going from 40 to 30 days. Yeah. Okay. And, and the reason why we held off on discussing it last time or even just approving it, because it seems like a pretty simple change, I'll admit. Um, so we were expecting there may be a whole list of things that we may need to change Boulder, uh, you know, revised codes. Um, uh, your thoughts on that or? Is, um, no? I mean, I can't advise on if, you know, you should adopt any um, other of our rule efficiencies or anything like that. But, um, you know, we did cover, I think, all of the rule efficiency uh, changes today that we implemented. Um, but we also are going to be holding some efficiencies work groups over the next few months um, where it's going to be an ongoing discussion. We may have other future changes as well. And so um, business owners might attend such, such sessions and, and they might come back with a whole bunch of recommendations because I mean, it's going to happen in every municipality that, um, I don't know, at least it could be every municipality in Colorado, really, um, which is going to pull you stretched thin, but oops. Um, but, you know, we're just trying to deal with it right here in Boulder, so. Right, yeah. And um, if you want to mirror it or, or you know, go a different direction, I think that's, that's up, to, up to Boulder. Mm -hmm. All right, anybody else with questions? I just wanted to thank you um, for the presentation and for putting it together. I know that it's a ton of stuff that changed. Um, so to be able to do that, even the way that you did um, as efficiently as you did, that's pretty impressive. So appreciate that you guys did that and uh, appreciate your time. Thanks. And like I said, if there's any questions about any we didn't cover today or ones we did that come up later, feel free to reach out. I would echo what Kate said. Oh, sorry, I couldn't tell whether I was mute or not. I would echo what Kate said, thanks. Um, who would be the main contact person if we do um, I think uh, for now, I probably would be. And um, I don't have chat access, um, but I can follow up with an email to Kristen um, with my contact information, if that's helpful. OK, great. All right, thank you all so much. OK, thank you. Thanks. Chair okay. Kinsman, uh, Member Noble did join the meeting at 325. If you would like to reverse back to, excuse me, back to agenda item number three, matters from the cannabis enforcement officer. Yep, we held off Robin on doing uh, agenda. Okay. I'm so, so, I'm really sorry about that. I'm sorry, Pam. Thank you very much. Okay, do uh, you wanna go ahead, Pam? And okay. Um, for some reason, the past three weeks, we've seen a big decrease in the number of seized fake IDs. Um, all the dispensaries are talking about it when I go and visit them on my weekly basis, and we don't know why. <laughs> but that's a good thing, hopefully. Um, process 22... Two were issued summonses and six were sent to see you restorative justice. So we'll see if that trend continues for this upcoming month. Um, getting ready in the next week or two, once we solidify some dates, I'm going to do a joint compliance check with the state med. And then I'm going to do um, two uh, just city-based so going to really load up on those compliance checks over the next couple months. Robin, do you want to, not everybody on the board knows the question that you asked of staff, including Robin, I mean, including Pam. Yeah, I uh, had asked a question that some parents had asked me about uh, 
uh, an establishment that I shared with Pam that uh, they suspect of doing selling illegally to kids. And I wanted to make her aware of that and get an update on some of her plans for compliance. It sounds like you might be looking at that place and yeah, is that where you're at, Pam? Or? Well, I can only speak in general terms. Historically on the Hill, we usually get complaints of a variety of nature from three different uh, head shops slash tobacco license holders up there. Um, the There's one that historically <laughs> keeps coming up. Um, so we're brainstorming and we're going to do a multi, uh, focal attack for last of a lack of a better word on that establishment and see if we can't get them to get back into the fold and play by the rules. Okay. Thank you. Because I, I think one of the people I spoke with said she was frustrated because she had heard back that there really wasn't anything that you guys could do it was a little bit of a confusing thing for her. And so it sounds like you're looking at it and I'm really glad to hear that. I, I, that seems like the right next step. Yeah, there's there's different approaches by involving different agencies, uh, including a few of the state agencies because they have more uh, enforcement authority. Um, and they've always been involved on a on a different level. Um, we're just now kind of all getting together and uh, opening our communication lines more. <laughs> okay. There, there actually is enforcement taking place. We just don't always talk to each other on a quick enough basis so that we can provide that information to concerned citizens. Okay. Well, I'm glad I, and I'm glad you're in touch with the parents as well. And I know a few of the parents have been asked, would your kid talk with us? And from the thread I saw, the kids do not want to do that. So it's really tricky, but um, it does sound like that particular place is a real problem, or at least in the conversations that were had that I was, that I heard. So. Yeah. And these types of complaints, and for us to do an effective investigation, we really need nice to let us interview the yeah. children. Uh, it, it just helps us expand our investigation and have the documentation and proof we need to move forward, uh, either in the civil or criminal arena. But, you know, I, I understand the parents' hesitancies. You know, it, yeah. it's up to them, so... Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that update. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you're looking. Love to hear from you again if there's more to share next time. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That's all I have. Any other, any other questions? Okay. Thanks. Officer, good night. Um, let's see. Next agenda item. Do we have, oh, is uh, Christiana McCormick in the waiting room? Or what's the story? Um, no, Chair Kunzman, she is not. Unfortunately, um, she had something come up. Oh, sorry, Kristen, you go ahead. Your hand's raised. Yeah, go ahead, Kristen. Oh, no problem. Thanks, Kristen. Um, so I think what Kristen was getting ready to say was, um, Christiana is not going to be able to attend the meeting today, but she did include um, a memo kind of outlining needs and desires petitioning for liquor licensing, as well as some um, example petition materials for what, what exactly that looks like. So um, if you have any questions, staff is happy to help try to answer those today. Or if you have questions specifically for Christiana, we can ask her to come back to a future meeting. Andy, you can go ahead. Andy, go ahead. Yeah, and I, some, something came up that was an emergency, so I, I'm sorry about that, and she apologizes. Um, 
should free up some time for tonight, but she said she'd be welcome to come back next month or the month after if the board wanted. So I think an interactive session would be a lot more helpful than just reading through the attachments. And neither, I mean, I know Roberto's, you know, new to the game, but neither you nor Roberto would want to try to put on her. I don't think so. I think BLA oh. is unique <laughs> and she can, she's going to speak to that a lot better than at least I can. So. Okay. Um, this is 413. I think we can go ahead and go on to policy suggestion forms. The yes. first policy, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. The first policy suggestion form was from Native Roots regarding medical wellness centers. This has been continued a couple of times and from um, a June 5th packet submission. And Andy, if I'm not mistaken, you've been looking in, or you've been thinking about this and researching yeah. this, you wanna tee it up? Yeah, yeah, so this was, um, and I should thank my colleague, Reva Ward as well, who's on, but um, we did a pretty deep dive into the legislative history to try to hunt down why this particular, I guess, rule came into effect. Um, the long and the short of it, so this is, if you recall, this is the separate consultation room for medical marijuana facilities, and it's part of the wellness center definition. And so what we believe happened, excuse me, I'm uh, recovering from something as well here. So if I cough, I apologize. Um, but this derives from it's six dash 14 dash seven is the actual location within the, um, the Boulder revised code. And it requires that the business, uh, quote includes a secured and locked medical marijuana dispensary room, one or more private rooms for consultation on the medical use of marijuana or other services in a separate reception area for screening of patients and waiting for non-patients. Um, and so we dove into sort of the history of the ordinances surrounding this. And the best we could tell, we also spoke with some colleagues, the best we could tell is that this is really a carryover of when, when medical marijuana was first getting, um, I shouldn't say first getting introduced, but it was being treated like, massage and acupuncture and aromatherapy and some of these other sort of medical tangential uses. Um, and so for purposes of the Boulder zoning code, those got lumped in together. Um, and so I believe the actual policy suggestion form mentioned essentially why, why do we have this? Because we're not allowed under law to, you know, make recommendations or give medical advice as part of these consultations and so, or as part of this, <clears throat> excuse me, as part of the dispensation. And so the long and the short of it is, is that, um, and I'll, I'll kick it over for Rewa in case she wants to provide additional thoughts, but we didn't see anything under state law that would prohibit CLAB from recommending to change the Boulder City Council. That would obviously be the Boulder City Council's prerogative, whether to take that up. Um, and I, we also have some thoughts about the process the board might use for pushing policy suggestion forms through sort of a, um, a um, I guess, a more robust consideration process in the future. But I mean, suffice it to say, we didn't see any reason why that can be removed. Um, it, it would just take a little bit of um, a little bit of drafting know-how because that kind of requirement is built into a few different parts within the Boulder Revised Code. So, um, Rewa, do you have anything to add or any clarifications or anything? No, I don't have anything to add, but I, I, I did, you just hit on it, what I was thinking that, you know, it, uh, other portions of the code are, are intertwined with this, you know, specifically Title IX. Mm -hmm. That was all. Thank you. Any more thoughts on streamlining a process? So, Riva? I have thoughts on that, unless Riva wants to go first. You want me to go? No, you can go first, Andy. It has a question. Okay. 
You want to go first, Kate? Oh. I was just, uh, I was actually just going to ask about Title IX. Is that referring to like wellness centers or the personal service side of it? Is that where the tie is? That's the, <clears throat> let me pull it up here. Um, the personal service side, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So that's, um, anyway. And in response to uh, um, Chairman Kuntzman's, uh question, you know, the the board has, at least my understanding is the board has sort of, it gets a policy suggestion form, discusses it, and then um, I think we know that as part of the board's authority, you can make recommendations to council. Um, but I don't know how much thought has been put into what that process should look like on a recurring basis and when that suggestion to council should occur. Um, and so that's a little timely because I know with council going on their retreat soon, they've specifically asked the boards to comment on what you're working on and um, to provide an update. So I think Rewa, Roberto and I were discussing, it would be helpful for the board to have um, a set process where when a policy suggestion form comes in, and this is just me spitballing as to what kind of we thought the process could look like, you know, it comes in, comes in for initial discussion for, by the board members. If the board thinks they want to evaluate it further, then they could uh, task staff in the city attorney's office with evaluating the operational impact of a change that may be requested by the policy suggestion form along with legally whether the change would be permitted or if there's any legal pitfalls associated with it. The next meeting, we could come back and report on that. And then if the board still wanted to pursue it or consider it, that the board would then hold a public hearing um, to facilitate sort of that public comment and public involvement process on that particular topic. Following that public hearing, then the board would make a decision just like it normally would. And if the decision is to recommend a change, then that would be slotted for um, what, whenever, if you were gonna do it semi-annually or annually, like kind of a, com a single recommendation to council containing all the changes that the board discussed, went through, considered, and you're getting them in front of the council at hopefully an opportune time, but in any event, in a way that's gonna make it so that whatever they're focused on, they can focus on this and hit everything at the same time, hopefully, um, and move on. So that's in a nutshell what at least I thought the process could look like. I think the public comment portion is really important. That's the one of the main reasons why this board is here is to hear public comment and perspectives. Um, so facilitating that public comment, um, but just having some sort of a consistent process where these policy forms can get can get moved through. So I know that was I know that was a a lot of verbiage, but um, that's something that's been percolating in our minds that I just wanted to throw. So just to be concrete, so if we took this, um, I, I heard what you just said, and we took this um, policy suggestion form about um, consultation room, would it then also, once it gets to city council, do then they have to have another public comment before they can make a change or? They'd have to, if they were gonna make a change to ordinance, they'd have to go through the regular ordinance process with Rewa, I just saw you unmuted, do you wanna? describe that. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, yeah, they have to go through the regular ordinance process, which requires two ratings of an ordinance, one on consent. And normally, unless it's administrative in nature, and I don't think this would necessarily be administrative in nature, um, would require a public hearing. Well, I know I'm purposely discussing, or we're only discussing the consultation room situation right now, but if we jumped for a moment to the um, 40 day to 30 day, is that an administrative change? I don't think, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Rewa. go ahead. I was going to say, I don't think anything marijuana related would be administrative in nature necessarily. Okay. okay. Um, I, I think it would be of great interest to the public. 
um, and, and, and the council. But, but of course, I leave that up to the attorneys. And, and it could. I mean, part of the public hearing process would be, as far as CLAB goes, would be one to be able to take it to council and describe that it all, already has gone through a public hearing process. Um, two, public hearings generally with government are designed to help decision makers make in, informed decisions. So you all, as part of your recommendation, you would hopefully hear from both sides if it's not a controversial issue such as the 40 to 30 day, that may not be a controversial issue. Um, you might get no public comment, which is fine, um, but there might be issues that are, maybe end up being surprisingly um, you know, controversial and there might be members of the public or businesses that come in with very valid intelligent insights that then alter what you want to recommend to council. So that's kind of the the underlying rationale be, be between or behind going that additional step, if that makes sense, Chair. Yeah, well, I understand. Um, okay. Mm, what? So, do you want to do you want to um, say anything more specifically about the consultation room requirement then, other than the process that you described? And I'm. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm okay. It doesn't look like fun. Uh, so from a staff, oh, go ahead, Robin. Thank you, Tom. I just have a question, Andy. So you just talked through the history of where that, uh, you know, where the current rule is and why you, I think I heard you say operationally, it didn't feel like a big problem to, change it, but I'm thinking back to when we looked at social consumption and we had sort of a written opinion from the city staff that was that was actually a recommendation not to opt in for a variety of reasons. And I just wonder if the staff would issue an opinion on these things, um, if, if that's a possibility, because while that, you know, kind of overview of how how the rule came about and what you think this change would or wouldn't do. I just wonder if there's things that we're not able to imagine as an unintended thing. And I'd like to make sure we're covering those bases before we make a recommendation to council. Yeah, I, I can't speak for staff, but I mean, we're happy to like any sort of um, recurring form that you would like us to complete or um, something like that to contain an explanation about sort of either CAO SOTs or um, staff SOTs. That's the, it, whatever works for the board, so. Kristen or Kristen or Rewa, do you want to weigh in? Or Kate, or, or you had your hand up there, Kate. I'll wait for them to respond. I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Kate. Then I was just going to say that we in the in the po uh, policy suggestion forms there is the the staff use only section um, of the the <laughs> form, and if we do decide to move forward, then maybe we just adjust. I mean, it says, you know, um, approved action to be taken, if any, right, continued information. And then it says denied if it conflicts with state or exceeds funding or resources limits, so on and so forth, needs additional clarification or justification. And then a comment section, you know, maybe there's something specifically, um, you know, like, like um, recommendation, um, if that's what you're talking about, Robin. And then it could just say, you know, um, you know, uh, and maybe there's some language that that the city could use that that reflects no concern or you know like yes like we don't have an opinion but you know there's no operational impact or whatever the language would be um, that y'all would would want to do but I think that we already have at least the form has a pro you know has that information there and it would be a written record of what it is so um, I think we could just use that but I like the idea for the process and I think that just you know defining the components of what part of the process. Um, we're in and how we move through it. I think all of that makes a lot of sense. Um, I also think from a, 
um, uh, an operational standpoint, um, the consultation room, I think is, you know, I, I think there is really no um, current, I mean, I don't, I don't know any, any place that is using it. I don't know all of the operators in, in Boulder, or of, of course, um, but I know that, that when working at the farm, um, we had a space that was there and we never used it for over five years um, at Root. Um, at the medical facility. It was there. It was a room that was open, no storage, no anything. It was just a room that sat there open with a, a table and chairs. Um, and I do think that the language in H2, 614.7 H2, does kind of lead itself to, to giving suggestions or recommendations to um, patients about how to use the product in ways that, that is a little bit too far, I think, in my opinion. Um, and I think that we should you know, stay away from that as much as possible. And my thought for this process was always, um, has always been kind of the same, which is at some point, I think we do need to, or in terms of, I know that we don't have the ability to talk about Title IX or go into that, but I think that, you know, at some point, I think marijuana dispensaries probably need its own category um, to, you know, figure out where that goes. Because I know that we've talked about is it personal use? Is it a wellness center? Is it a brew pub or liquor store? Is it like, where would you put it? And I think that, you know, at some point I do think that it's going to be around um, and, and the thought should, should be to, to finding a pro an appropriate place for it. Um, and I don't know that another category fits into ensuring that it's not in certain areas of um, in the city. Thanks, Kate. We might one might have to change the order of uh, of the items on that page for, or the staff use only page. Like it could have comments, like pre decision comments, and then the approved, continued, or denied, and then another space for comments if other comments are needed at that point. What do you think about that? Andy and or any staff people. I, I think that could work. I don't know if Roberto has thoughts on that. I, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the attorneys like to get your perspective too before uh, we, we sort of opine on things. So that's always helpful. So, um, but any sort of pre decisional analysis is fine too. So. Maybe it's certain questions about conflict and about operational impact and about, you know, like the, the maybe the, the prior stuff is that, right? Um, what are the, you know, potential impacts of making this change um, and the history as to why it's there, right? That part of it could be required on the form. Um, and then maybe it's not a, a suggestion, suggestion or a recommendation from the city, but it's, it's just, hey, we've checked these three boxes um, and now it's your turn to have the conversation. That sounds like a good idea. Is this a form that's used for other boards? No, it's not. Um, when the CLAB uh, was um, in its inception, uh, we were tasked uh, to find a way for policy suggestions. And this form, this is actually the third version of that form. Robin, you had your hand up. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just feel like you know, we don't have a robust process to move these things through. And it, it, I don't know, it feels like businesses won't come to us and ask us for, um, and I see Ethan nodding his head. And so we do, I think, I, I love Kate's suggestion that the form that's already in place just get amended a little bit. And maybe what, what I would suggest is that the staff provide context and maybe that's history or context and uh, uh, what the staff thinks about the change, positive or negative. And then if they have questions the CLAB needs to deliberate, we could do that as well. But then we could actually have something actionable. And I want to go back really quickly to something that Andy was talking about in terms of a larger process. So we have a couple conversations going on right now. We have a couple policy suggestion forms. We're talking about hopefully at the next meeting, the possibility of doing a needs and desires hearing for 
um, new licensees, those kinds of things. And I think we do need to say, let's look at our calendar and have a set of suggestions to give to council, you know, once every six months or once a year or something like that, so that we can work in a more productive way. Because otherwise it just feels sort of not productive. We're just floating. Yeah. Here, here. Well, our planning meeting, I I made an analogy to we don't want to be considered like the um, when somebody applies for a, a, a permit to do some alterations on their house, you know, how people in Boulder like to complain about how long that process or the, their business too, and how long that process takes. And we should try to make it crystal clear how the process is going to play out. So Kate, what were the three elements that uh, the consequences, historic history of how you know the situation ended up the way it did? And what was the third component? Just thoughts from staff or I think you covered it. I mean, context and history is kind of one component, conflict, question mark. Um, is the second one and then potential impact was positive or negative um, if there are any those are the three that I identified not to say that they're the only ones but just the ones that I thought of just now yeah anybody else have any other ideas on what to add for because we make a version four of the policy request for them. Can I jump in? I, the only thing yeah. I think would be some clarification around this idea that Rewa brought up. Is this an administrative change or is it a uh, an ordinance change? I think just to be clear on that would give people some sense of timing. Um, and then also if the staff really just, there is a denied thing on here. Um, and so if it didn't work to be clear on that too, just more clarity, more transparency. Well, can we go ahead and discuss as a board this policy suggestion form, the first one, I mean, the one that's been on our, that was presented back in uh, April of 2023. Tom, I, I, I think you obviously can, I just, um... I wonder if it wouldn't be helpful to at least open it up for public comment at some point, like have it as a separate agenda item for public comment with some sort of notion that you're going to be adding it or consideration for adding to <clears throat> for recommending change to city council or something to that effect. Um, just so the, the public has a chance to come in and speak before, before the board deliberates and sort of makes a decision whether it's going to move forward or not. Well, I assume that we were going to be doing that maybe next meeting. Oh, okay. If, if it goes forward. Um, I mean, was if 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 public was paying attention, it was in the packet, you know, and even someone from Native Roots could have made a public comment, but if they didn't even feel motivated to make a public comment. I wonder how many other, I mean, I'm not going to, you know, assume nobody's going to do public comment, but, but we can make it more obvious next meeting. Anyone's thoughts on just the policy suggestion form as written? Go ahead, Ethan. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Now we're okay, here. great. Um, I support it. And I'm, I think, you know, we, we discussed this when it was originally introduced, um, native roots representation, I think said their bit, they, they probably are just hoping that 
you know, the policy suggestion form and the process surrounding that is going to proceed as it should. Um, but anything that can bring the the BRC closer to alignment with the MED's role set, um, that's that's a win in my book. It helps to alleviate any sources of confusion. Um, so fully support it. I'd, I'd like to see this uh, move forward. And if we need to um, outline a, a streamlined process for policy suggestion forms to get pushed all the way through to city council, um, you know, let's let's make sure that's a, a priority. Can you forgot who asked? Maybe Kate. Um, you talked about, or you asked, Title IX is land use code in Boulder Revised Code. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. City so can't answer that too, but yes, Title IX is land use code. And is there a particular chapter and or sub chapter that is applicable? So I was trying to find it. Well, I guess because they didn't list it in their in their um, policy review form. So it's it's the 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 and the state the city can answer this better than I can. But there's a table under Chapter Six Use Standards that has personal service um, notated and delineated that shows which zoning districts allow for that that type of facility to be in which um, district. And um, and so personal service is what has uh, you know it also has some in a separate section something about um, the the square footage limitations as well, um, which is like fifteen hundred square feet um, in, a, in a different chapter um, or actually in a different section of the chapter, um, and basically in six sixteen seven b the location um, it says that. Um, personal personal service use is for uh, retail marijuana or recreational marijuana center, um, and so because it's defined as such, it's it's pinged around. But um, that's going to be I'll, I'll leave that for the for the city. But that's the the non legalized way that I've I've been learned to or been taught to understand it. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, and I, I was just going to add the the planning board. Um and Rewa, correct me if this is wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure the planning board has oversight over all Title VI issues. I'm, I am, I am, I'm speculating there, but I, suffice it to say that if it's zoning, there's another board that um, a recommendation would need to go through if we were gonna make suggested changes to this 961. So that's why I think we're gonna, uh, the thought is we could just restrict the changes that are needed to, chapter six um, or um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, not chapter six, um, the marijuana code six dash 14 dash seven, seven. Yeah. If there were any changes that were suggested for a title nine, because you know, the club doesn't have any, any purview over, over title nine, you know, planning would be involved we would, um, of course, get our planning attorneys involved as well if there were suggested changes to Title IX. Oh, go ahead, Kate. Oh, I just have a question for, for city staff then. If the recommendation would be to go through with this, then what would be the recommendation to untangle this strictly within 614 and 616 to make it so it was just something that we could recommend from a collab perspective um, without having to work through the Title IX portion of that? Would that just be an exception? Yeah, so what I was thinking is there's, I think there's like two sections. We'd have to draft the, the ordinance language. I mean, we'd have to get into it and see what needs to change. But um, as a general rule of thumb, legislation that's modified after other le legislation, if there's a conflict, 
then the, the most recent modification prevails. So we would just explicitly state, you know, this does not require a consultation room or something to that effect um, um, if we needed to remedy that. So that could be one approach, but another approach could be just to get it in front of the planning board, um, which we very well just might do. Um, that would take a little bit more time, but that would probably be prudent in case we needed to make any additional changes or they wanted to weigh in. Yeah, and Andy, just to, I mean, there, there's a lot of history here. This is back to marijuana advisory panel days. Um, this conversation has been had for years about the consultation room and there has been a kind of a ping pong battle of where where this conversation belongs and planning board says it's with us and, and um, we've been told that it's with them. And so how do we if we want to, I, I, I struggle with this particular um, form because I feel like it's just been something that we've batted back and forth and there's been no way to have a real conversation about what or where it could go and who should be the one to address it. Um, so I apologize if there's frustration on my end of kind of like trying to understand what, what we could do, but just trying to we're gonna, if we keep getting it, we need to have a, a process to filter certain things like this because we, we do come across other things in Title IX too. And if there's just like an avenue, we could say, okay, well, we have a recommendation or we have a suggestion and then we pass it along to the, the planning board, great. But right now it's just been, it's just been, we're, we've got walls on both sides. Yeah, and I, I, I hear that, um, you know, the, you can always just make whatever recommendation you want to make to council and they, they have the authority to approve it outright. Um, but it could get to council and they could decide, well, they want to send it back down to planning board or planning board might get wind of it and think, well, why didn't this come to us? So there's kind of a, um, I mean, I don't see what would stop you all from, if you wanted to send this to planning board first and say, this is a referral that we've decided this would be prudent and we're asking for your blessing and just have that added as an item. Um, so I think that's something that Kristen, Chingaris, and our office can accomplish if that's the route that you wanted to go. I appreciate that. I also would also say that I don't know, I, 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 haven't, I don't have these pulled up right now, but the marijuana advisory panel had recommendations that came to this board at the very beginning, some of which were the Title IX recommended changes that were supposed to get on planning board's calendar at some point. Um, and I know that it was, it keeps getting put further and down the list because it's less of a priority, which fine, we've already, I just worry that this, this might already be on there. And so we're talking about um, a topic that we have already addressed and we've already put recommendations for at, at least from some panel or board in the past. Um, and so if we're talking around something that's already on the plan that just hasn't been addressed, then we may be wasting our time. Riwa, did you want to say something since you came back on? <clears throat> well, I, and, and to add, I mean, the BRC does state that the advisory board shall not involve itself in any, any review into the land use regulations, which is that Title IX. So obviously that came up at one point earlier, but you know that doesn't mean you all can't make a recommendation to planning board or make a recommendation for a change to six fourteen. Um, so. Well, is there just we haven't heard from a few people, Brian? You, I know you have reason to be quiet, but any thoughts and Stacy and Michael? Any, um, no, I would just add that, like, I understand the kind of administrative ambiguity around this, but that I think that, um, we do have like a responsibility, just kind of echoing what Kate said. To folks who are submitting these public comment forms that we that we should be responsive to them in some kind of way that's like actionable rather than getting ping pong so i would be able i would like to sort of either bring a close draw this to a close in some kind of way where we sort of make a recommendation to planning board to sort of consider this and like it's the balls in your court we're statutory statutorily prevented mm -hmm. from like considering this like so you really need to sort of lead on this now be kind of 
the recommendation I'm like leaning towards, but I'm like open to other suggestions. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Are you in general support of the change? I, I support the, the general policy suggestion that I think that um, as Kate and others kind of alluded to, I don't think that mar like cannabis businesses should even maintain the appearance of trying to provide medical advice. So the more that we can do to sort of strip that out uh, or, or the appearance that you can receive medical advice at a dispensary, would I'm completely in support of. Stacy, your thoughts? I agree. It seems like this person or a constituent should be able to have an actionable way of having their concerns noted and dealt with. Um, that sounds pretty reasonable. I, I just don't really have the answer for that. You know, I'm not really sure the best way of dealing with it. Michael, any? Uh -huh. You're there. Yep, I'm here. No, I don't have any comment. I'm still like sort of processing this in my mind as to what's the best way to address it. In general, you're not opposed to the concept as suggested by the policy suggestion form? I mean, I'm not necessarily opposed to it. No. Okay. I mean, we, we I'm just not sure what's the best way to go about doing this or handling this. Yeah. Um, Tom, Robin, can I? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I mean, I'd like to just make a suggestion that we, um, ask the staff to go back to the uh, policy suggestion form and provide us with the information and in writing that we just talked about, which would be context for the decision and uh, their recommendation or positives or negatives. And then, um, and this again is just all in relationship to Title VI, the, the suggestions that they're making there. I mean, for me, I need to, you know, I want to look at this a little more carefully. I think um, there is confusion for consumers sometimes around this idea of medicine and the, the land use code. I understand it's at play here, but if we're taking out these different sections, I want to understand what continues to make this a medical facility. Because if you take out again section two six fourteen seven h two, basically what the code says now is that the business provides caregiver services, including knowledgeable cons consultation on the effects of amount and forms of ingestion of different types of marijuana for medical use. So if we take that out and take these other things out, what continues to make a medical marijuana center a medical marijuana center and is that potentially positive or negative and if that's the case maybe the it's a bigger land use question which is just we're going to have dispensaries that can do this and be more clear to the consuming public because you know part of what's written here seems to create an expectation that you could get that advice at a medical center so if we're taking those things away what's the consumer expectation and understanding because people are uninitiated sometimes and we don't want to create that confusion so again my suggestion would be that we ask the staff to go back to the policy suggestion forms provide us the information on the um, rewritten form that we're asking for, and then we could take action at the next meeting. Who would, uh, Andy, who, is it you or who, who would have to, did, do you have enough clarification from Robin as she just described? 
I think so. What I'm hearing is we should go back, maybe uh, revise, and CAO should work with staff to revise the policy suggestion form, and then come back with a written set of recommendations or a written set of, uh, I guess, analysis that you all could then apply and make a decision on. Is that correct? Yeah, and I mean, I'm not asking for an encyclopedia. I don't think anybody here, you know, needs a massive amount of work. But what is where does the city stand? Where does the city staff stand on this particular question? Um, and uh, yeah, okay, I think that would be helpful. That's that's fine. In in our view, I don't know, Kristen, if you have thoughts on it, or Kristen Teague. I think that's fine too. I just want to clarify, are you asking for us to do that for this particular policy suggestion form or all policy suggestion forms that we've received? What's, what's the scope of the request? I guess speaking as the chair, I, I think it's two parts. One is redoing the policy suggestion form so that it has a comment period that leads into our decision making. Um, with the three elements that Kate proposed. And then I think just with respect to moving forward on the two items in front of us today, um, the same kind of information that would be on future policy suggestion forms for each of those two items. Does that sound right, Robin? Yeah, and I think, I, I hope I'm not wrong on this, but I believe these are the two policy suggestion forms where we have people waiting for a response. Yeah, one's from April 13th, 2023, and one's from November 20th, 2023. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. And the second one, just in my humble opinion, should be easy, because it's just really to make it in line with the revised MED rules that we just heard about. It may be easy, but th that's where having that sort of written. Yeah, well, that, that, that yeah, that's, let's yeah. make it part of the process. Okay, how's that sound to you? Like all of it? Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a non-voting member. Y'all can, <laughs> y'all, y'all can make decisions. No, I mean, I, I think that it makes sense. Um, I, I guess I, I'm always just curious. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that what I'm hearing is that people don't have enough information to vote on, um, or to make recommendations on either of these. So, um, I think that if we need more information, then we should get it, so that people feel ready to vote and make change or not. Okay. And then can I ask one more quick question? Sorry. But with respect to a public hearing, so we have our meeting, say let's we get these back next week with a little more context from the staff. We wouldn't be able to make a recommendation at that point or or take a vote because we hadn't noticed a public hearing specific to this issue or is noticing the public comment period in our regular meeting enough andy can you clarify that yeah so so there's a distinction between public hearings and quasi judicial hearings i think for this it would just be like a public comment period with notice of the topic and the decision to be rendered so it's not the full admission of parties or anything like that there are no parties there are no you know, there's no individual that's had a license that's at issue. So I just want to clarify that. So the idea would be, you know, a month in advance or, or for the agenda, it'd be part of the agenda, which gets published in the newspaper um, as well as online. And then you would offer it up as an opportunity before you deliberated to hear any other thoughts about it. And I, uh, to, to the chair's point, the, you may not get any public comments, um, but you might get people, especially if it's material to industry or material to 
public interest or, you know, who, whomever is interested, you might get people who want to come in and opine on it. And um, so that, that would be the, the idea is to just give some advance notice that you're going to, you're going to issue a formal decision on this at some point or during that meeting following public hearing. I guess to take Robin's question one point further is, could we, if we ask for yours and city staff's comments on each of these issues for the next meeting, can we also have public comment at the next meeting? Yeah. Okay, because I'm I'm I am all for what Ethan said. You know, try to make this you know as user friendly as possible. But yet, you know, in the interests of everybody else that presented, you know, making sure we dot our I's and cross our T's. All right, do we have to have a motion to do what we just said? I, I don't think so. You can. Uh we can just work with staff to get it set up, so. Okay. Does anyone wanna make any specific comments about either of the two um, suggestion forms? I, I, I would like to make comment about the video surveillance just quickly, just about the 40 to 30 days. Um, I think from a, an, an operator perspective, um, it, it's really about when when the, the state was talking about, you know, like making efficiencies or, or helping because of the financial climate of, of things and inflation and, and what some of the businesses are dealing with. I think from somebody who's worked in, in a business before, um, between the difference between 30 and 40 days is is substantial um, to be able to hold that you need a certain number of, of um, they're called UPCs and different you know things to be able to hold for backups in order to, to, to make sure that you have enough storage capacity within your facility um, and and otherwise you know without the I mean, again like what's the difference between 30 and 40 is it really one big piece of unit you know equipment or is it you know I, I can't I can't speak to that portion of it um, but what I can say is that it is a financial, um, you know, um, burden, um, the longer that you have to keep recordings and the likelihood that we had people coming in looking for something that happened, you know, past that 30 day mark was typically just an inspector who was asking to see, you know, whether or not you had 40 days. It wasn't that there was something they were looking into or that they needed to find that information. Um, but there are typical things too, where they can require you to, to hold different information. If there's an investigation looming, like, Hey, you know, can you record or get a copy of this recording from this day? We are looking into it. And so that you can hold it for, you know, months after, um, that date. Um, so whether it's 30 or 40, I, I mean, I think that's where it's just like, is it, does it matter to Boulder those 10 days? Is there value in keeping those 10 days? Um, additional recording of all of your cameras across the facility, um, and is the the potential financial burden on the operator worth, you know, the 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 benefit of having it, right? So that's all I'll say. Thank you. Any other comments about either one of the two policy suggestion forms? Go ahead, Robin. I guess I would just add, I appreciate that background, Kate. I'd love to hear from Ethan as well, if you have any more perspective to offer Ethan on that particular question. And then I don't know if Pam or some other person who might want to access, you know, a 35th day of, of tape or, or not tape, but recording, um, if that actually, if there's any data that shows us that's ever been useful and, um, worth worthwhile of a change I, I don't want to be onerous but i do i do wonder about why was it 40 in the first place and um has it ever been useful yeah i don't have too much um else to add on to kate's statements um 
that's that's pretty much it cut and dry like you, it's it's memory um that requires energy and that costs money to keep it around um and additional equipment to keep on site um there's there's absolutely a cost associated with it um from an operator's perspective anytime that we've ever had to access our cameras um it's always been you know within a matter of hours uh you know 12 to 24 hours at most where we needed to review something that happened um i in my time in the industry i've never had to go back 40 days um i don't I haven't even had an inspector ask me to go back that far and you have a number of cameras at green dot I'm oh sorry. yeah yeah And Pam, I don't think Pam is with us anymore. Right? No, I don't think she is, but I wonder if licensing, do you guys have to access these recordings for any thing uh, licensing requ uh, related? We have access uh, video surveillance footage for enforcement matters. Um, and we did check in with Officer Geniac on this proposal when it first came through and she was supportive of making the change to align the state um, schedule if you'd like more detail on that I'm sure she's happy to be to elaborate on that at the next meeting okay so um staff and our attorneys do you need any more clarification or we move on and uh, maybe take a very short break because I got to get the agenda back up here again. But um, there's not going to be much long, much more in the meeting. So we, we could also just forge on, finish early. Let me take a flavor of the room. Forge on. For John, Michael says. For John. Okay, let's for John. Uh, that would be matters from the city attorney. Agenda item seven. Yeah, thanks. Um, I've done plenty of talking uh, this meeting, so. Um, in that case, but, that, you know, Roberto, uh, in, in our meeting, the planning meeting, Roberto gave a little yeah, Short, a paragraph of his uh, trajectory, which um, some of you might like to hear what I got to hear in our planning meeting. Do you want, are you up for that, Roberto? Certainly. Uh, so hi, everybody again, Roberto Ramirez. Uh, I am not from Colorado, but I got stationed here uh, when I was on active duty in the Air Force uh, back in 2001. Um, so I have, I just started my 24th year in the Air Force between active duty and the reserves. Uh, and I've served in all sorts of capacities uh, here in the US, all over Asia, all over Europe and South America. Um, I spent 10 years with the city attorney's office in Arvada. And uh, the last seven years, I was a district court judge in the 17th Judicial District, so Adams County and Broomfield County. Um, I left the bench to join the city attorney's office, but I am still a judge um, in the United States Air Force. I'm a federal court of appeals judge, so in Washington, D.C., and I kind of split my time between the two jobs. Super excited to be here with you guys. Great. Thank you. Anyone with questions? Chair, if I could just note yeah. that um, Roberto will be taking over legal advisory uh, duties for the board. So we, our office has had some reshuffling and there's sort of uh, an examination of alignment of skill sets. And Roberto is a former judge, which is incredible. I, he, you know, that's, uh, he's a district court judge, which is not an easy accolade to obtain. And 
So he brings a lot of skills and experience with that perspective as well. And so the plan is for me to, at some point here, roll off of this board, though I think there's probably some help I can provide moving forward. But um, I think for meetings moving forward, I'll be probably in attendance at the next one and supporting the next one. But Roberto is going to be the primary general counsel for this board um, moving forward, which I really appreciate. And I think it's a really good, uh, he's going to be a really good asset for the hearings. So um, yeah, I appreciate it. So. Okay. Anything else for a quick note? Part? I will, I will stay on and support Roberto just FYI. Okay. That's good. What was there? Was that in question? No, I just wanted to let everybody know that I, I'm going to tag along with Roberto and stay with y'all. So, okay, all right, cool. Uh, then, uh, if, with nothing else, then matters from the regulatory licensing licensing office. Sorry, I can't say that. Either of the Christians? Yeah, I'm happy to take this one. So. A um, couple things on our agenda for today. Just a reminder about board recruitment. So the application window for board recruitment did close on the 29th. Uh, we received four applications for CLAB, which is a really great turnout. Um, the next step is for council interviews, which will take place in mid-February. And then council will appoint the new members at their council meeting on March 7th. And then the effective date for the terms for the new members will be on April 1st. Any questions about that? Yeah, point of clarification. So with um, Allison vacating, will either, will any of these, if, if someone um, takes uh, Evan's seat or is chosen for Evan's seat, will some of the other applicants be considered for the Ex officio? Yes. Good. And I'll just chime in. I, I looked at the, the applications. I'm not sort of reviewing these in any official capacity. This is, but that um, three of them are from industry, three of the four. So um, for whatever concerns that we might have had in the past about the difficulties from recruiting from industry to fill that seat, I'm grateful for staff and whoever else was able to sort of ensure that we had got three competitive looking candidates for that uh, seat. Is that Maybe it's Ethan oh, too. Is that um, open to all of us, Brian? I didn't, I wasn't aware that we could see the applicants. I um, will uh, text you a link. Okay, thank you. I did try, thank you for the recognition. Well, I was I was approached a few times, and I think I don't, I don't know I don't know who the applicants are, but I'm guessing that two of my two of the four might have uh, at least checked in with me. But but I don't know that because I don't know who ended up applying. So um, I'm not taking credit away from you, Ethan. You get all the credit <laughs> and the staff. Uh, all right, so anything else, Kristen C, Kristen T? Yeah, the other thing I was going to mention, um, Kristen T shared an exhibit with everyone this morning. City Council is requesting feedback from all of our city boards and commissions. They've asked for the top two or three community issues or opportunities on CLAB's mind, and the top two or three items on CLAB's work plan for the upcoming year. So the feedback to council can take any written format. It can be a letter letter or a memo. Um, there's no specific format that's required as long as it's written. Um, and council's most interested in hearing from the board as a whole, but you can acknowledge any dissenting or minority opinions in the written feedback. Um, so the deadline for this request is March 22nd. So we don't have a lot of time to pull something together, um, but we have this meeting and next meeting to have that discussion if the board does want to provide feedback to council. 
Any questions or comments on that? Thank you. Is the board interested in providing feedback? Is that something that we should have on the agenda for March? I mean, other than the process provided or in addition to the process provided? Yeah, so if, so if the board does want to provide feedback, it's going to need to be like a unified letter or memo that represents um, a consensus from the board. So if that's something that you'd like to put on the next agenda for March to carve out some time to, to have that discussion and pull something together, we can add that to the agenda. It's optional, you're not required to, but it is like a really good opportunity to provide feedback to council if, if the board's interested. So staff's just looking for direction as to whether that's something you want to pursue and if that's something that we should put on the agenda for the March meeting. I've not looked at that site yet. Does it ask you to identify which board you're on? So it's, um, yes, it will ask for CLAB as a whole to, to come together as a group and provide this feedback as a group. It's not individual feedback. Okay, and but it sort of also will be able to parse out which recommendation or which um, suggestions or which concerns came from which board or commission. Yes, it will be very clear um, what CLAB's top priorities are. And there will be some general document that that we can access that because maybe we didn't think of something that came up from somebody on the alcohol board or somebody on the planning board or whatever. So there's no template that's been provided. It's it's pretty open-ended. Um, however, CLAB wants to provide that feedback if you want to put together a letter or a memo. Um, it's not like a form that you fill out and submit to council. Mm, right. Well, I'll take a look at it. Uh, Robin? Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so something along the lines of giving the council an overview of what we've been working on, like, is the council aware that we're about to take on more responsibility in terms of hearings? I would think that giving them an update on that work would be important. And then um, in terms of next week, if we carve out some time to talk about this, I mean, I have some suggestions for what I think we might be wanting to work on over the next six months or so. Should we each bring a couple of ideas to discuss during that? Um, because we are a little bit, we don't, we don't have that knowledge right now. I mean, I, I do think we, we each need to come with some specific ideas maybe for discussion next week. And this could actually be very valuable to us going forward this exercise um and so i i'd love to do it i'd love to have a little more direction for us i think you know we've been so busy learning about the hearing process that we haven't necessarily set our own work plan or goals and so if we could use this as an opportunity to do that i think that could be really helpful um so yeah i'd love to come with uh, a short list of things that are on my mind and maybe just have that conversation. Would you like that ahead of time, Kristen C or Kristen T or? Yeah, there's a couple ways we can do this. Um, if, if board members want to email us individually with your top two or three items, we can try to put something together, like draft something before the next meeting and present it to the board. And that way you have like a document to start from. Um, or if you'd rather it be a conversation amongst the board, you can have that conversation in March. We just don't, we won't really have a lot of time after the March meeting to put together a document for the board to review. So if you want it to be drafted before the next meeting to review as a group, then it would be better for you all to send those suggestions to us ahead of time. I guess it depends how, if the board wants to review a draft document at the next meeting or not. Okay. 
I, I was just going to suggest, is there a way that the staff could, oh, did I go out? Okay, sorry. Um, did, uh, could the staff like put together like a draft memo, right? That kind of had, just had openings for the couple of topics for the community issues and the couple of topics for the, you know, the two topics that we're working on. Um, and so then there was a draft memo kind of, you know, um, discussing maybe where we're at, or I, again, I don't really know, but typically there's like a memo, like uh, to Tom's point about like a form, right? There's no form, but like typically there's like a structure to that memo. So we could just see, you know, visually what it would look like. And then we could just all come to the meeting with some ideas um, to have the conversation. And then we'd know kind of how we were plugging it in. Um, and we could just type it in or who, you know, one of the city staff could type it in as we agree to it and we could see it live um, and share it on screen and just show this is what's going to be, you know, as part of it. So then there would be this framework. We would all come with our ideas. And then by the end of the meeting, it could be like a working session. And by the end of the meeting, we have something that we can share. Yeah, we could absolutely put together a template and include that in the next packet. Kristen, do Oh, sorry, go ahead. Nope, that's all. Go ahead, Kristen. Oh, you're mute. Sorry, there's some big background going on behind me. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, as Kristen said, we can definitely put together a template of some sort. But if you're going to email potential suggestions, I would like to remind that the deadline for packet materials is technically Monday, February 19th, which is a city holiday. So um, we would be needing to have that memo final drafted for inclusion in the packet to review and work on at the um, March meeting. Um, you know, we'd have to finalize that document on or before the 20th of February. just to keep that in mind right. for everyone Anyone involved. have any key items that they've been thinking about? Because I have two that, uh, one that's already been mentioned today, I can't remember who mentioned it, uh, maybe Rewa, but um, maybe our, our recommendations went in front of city council maybe twice a year rather than once a year. Um, at least think that through and then a second thing, so I don't forget, um, I'm thinking that anybody who leaves the board either early or decides not to reapply, decide or, um, or just times out that they be given the opportunity to do like an exit interview um, or the exit set of comments you know, with their suggestions um, or their insight. Um, I think that could be helpful. Um, Ethan? Uh, first thing that came to my mind was, is this a, a good opportunity for us to get the hospitality recommendations back in front of council or you know, would that be outside of the scope of this request? You could put it on the list. Any other thoughts that anybody wants to share now before, I mean, they can, you can write them down and send an email to the, to the staff too. Robin? Um, the things that are on my mind are the, uh, I've been thinking more and more about the needs and desires uh, survey that the BLA does as something that would be really add a lot of validity to the licensing process in Boulder for uh any kind of marijuana business um and i think that's really something that the board should look at i know we didn't have a chance to get the get our questions answered today but that's something i'm really interested in for lots of reasons um i am hoping that we don't go back to council with social around social consumption but i certainly understand other board members desire to do that and i think it's worth a conversation um and i think back to what you started with tom about a little more of a clear process for our board so that we are actually doing something and um are responsive to 
the people who are asking us for help. So yeah, those would kind of be my top three things. Anyone else? And keeping note of all these either. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that nod. Go ahead, Kate. I'll just echo echo with what Robin said. I think some kind of like annual work plan for us um, would be could be something that we talk about things that we're we want to work on, whether it's process for handling suggest suggestion forms or process for how do we determine, you know, what our policy, you know, work is going to be like um, year to year, but creating some kind of uh, more structure um, to kind of our, I mean, we took, you know, originally these two big ideas of, or two big changes with delivery and hospitality. And now we're kind of just, you know, getting information and moving into the quasi-judicial. And so it's, I think, to Robin's point, I think it's, it's, it would be a great time to, you know, in the next few meetings or whatever, to have discussions about how to formalize a process for this. So I'll, I could echo that. I don't have my annotated agenda. Well, it's buried underneath things. Um, I'm assuming it has something about what are we going to talk about next time? Or what are we, what, what's on the on on the list that we need to do next time? And then we're I, I have a mental list of what can you go over what right now what we've been talking about so that we don't um, know ourselves. Um, on the annotated agenda, Chair Kunselman, all we have is a placeholder for agenda topics for future CLAB meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you provide those to us, I do make note of that. Um, in the packet, we do have our list of items, um, suggestions for future CLAB meetings. The current topics on that list are social equity, connect with businesses currently participating in social equity, transition to a quasi-judicial role, which is noted as ongoing, Discussion topics on education programs as to youth prevention and public health education. Updates on latest research and how it may impact policy specifically directed at edibles. We did have a partial present uh, coverage of this with the presentation from uh, Ms. Malone from Green Dot Labs previously. We have a notation for discussion topics for legislative and rulemaking updates from the state with a notation that that is ongoing as well as ongoing feedback from industry for suggested policy changes. Thanks. Just in case anybody needs to know that's on page 10. It has a list of potential speakers too. Rather short list, but. Mm -hmm. All right, so just for next meeting, we're moving, um, no, I just buried <laughs> Christiana's. Uh, I just buried this agenda. Uh, Christiana's presentation, we're going to do that next time. Okay. Uh, we're going to have um, feedback from staff on the two policy suggestion forms. And then have, do we have to have two? I assume we have to have two specific public comment periods for one for each of them as as well as general public comment Andy you're mute maybe yeah I, I, yeah you can just run them back to back with each decision so open it up for public comment take the public comment and then go into your deliberation for the topic and then for the next agenda item open it up for public comment take it and then move into deliberation, so. Okay, and then there's recommendation, recommendations from the staff or just thoughts from the staff, or excuse me, thoughts from the members and our staff on uh, future direction, future plans.
what else? Mr. Kunzman, may I ask you to restate that? I didn't quite. Um, Robin's probably better at than I am. We were just going to have time to discuss the um, submission of uh, a memo to city council for their retreat. Oh, so it's the council directive. Yeah. Thank you. With input from you know all all that want to have input. Okay. Am I forgetting something that we also plan for next month? That is all I have captured. Okay. All right. Were there any other comments from members, ex officio or otherwise, on future direction of CLEB? Ethan? Uh, earlier in the meeting, Andy, you had kind of verbally given us an outline of um, how you would envision the streamlining process of, of making recommendations to uh, city council. Is that something that we could get ironed out or in writing for the next meeting to, to review and help help start pushing that towards materialization? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to prepare a draft for the board to discuss and maybe implement. And if if there was an approved process in place, then maybe that could help make sure everybody's kind of keeping track on things. And even if an approval happens well before memo generation and submission to council, whenever that is, like so be it. But everybody will kind of know what that process is. So yeah, absolutely. I just want to make sure everybody else is in agreement on that too. I didn't hear any um, comments to the op comments to the opposition of that. Hey. Um. No. I. I'm ready to move on to the next um, comment. I don't want. If anybody had any comments on that, I don't want to jump in too soon. Okay. But I just wanted to ask about you know post the med conversation. I mean, we did you know, have a Q and A with them, but we didn't really have any discussion um, about anything um, that may need to be discussed or otherwise. So I just wanted to mention too, um, I don't know if anybody had any thoughts on, on those kinds of things, um, but I just realized that we had this big presentation and talked about all these things and didn't have a conversation about maybe what things we could discuss further. Um, so I don't know if people wanna do that. Um, but I just wanted to, to draw attention to it because I think in the past we had talked about a presentation and Q&A and then a discussion. And I think we just jumped past the discussion portion of that. Um, so just. Yeah, that's a good point. Robin? I'm glad you brought that up, Kate. I mean, the one thing that came to mind for me as we were going through these detailed changes from MED is that my understanding is that Boulder has to adhere to what med, med rules are, and then we can go a bit further. So the alignment, if something is misaligned, it would be Boulder needing to pull something back is my understanding. But again, we'd wanna look at the specific thing, but I did appreciate the presentation. I don't feel a sense of insecurity that we're out of whack because again, anything that they say is something that we're beholden to, we can just go a bit further. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Well, they did, um, I forgot how they said it, but there's, there's gonna be some forums that business owners may attend, it sounds like. I don't know if those, Ethan or maybe Kate, or would those be announced? How would, how would business owners know about the forms that they talked about? I think they were forums about future changes. Um, so, you know, they have work groups throughout the year and then they have, you know, sessions for the next 
um, like the annual legislation changes. Um, I don't know if they plan to do that anymore regularly. Um, I know in the past you could just find it on the website um, and then you can sign up for their um, email updates. Anybody on the board could also sign up for that. It's not license specific. So that's typically how people are in, informed. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ethan, did you wanna? Oh, hey, nailed it. Okay, Kristen, T? Yes, the um, Mr. Poyer with uh, MED um, did send us over an email with some information and some links. Uh, to items that he referenced in their presentation today that will be included in the next packet. Okay. Hey, um, your question's um, salient in that, um, you know, as we talked about it in the last or maybe the last two meetings that uh, we're wondering if there's going to be more policy suggestion forms that will fall in or you know being made to have something fall in line with the new recommendations right that's what we were concerned about or well, I think that, you know, the, the the hope was is that we'd be able to identify if there were any conflicts or things that we wanted to discuss. Obviously, we've been, you know, notified of the recordings, which is a big one. So that's obviously had a suggestion form. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody submitted one for a spa um, and, and thought of it differently than hospitality, but maybe they would think of it as the same. Um, but, I, you know, that's something that, that they talked about. Um, we've talked previously about hemp and um, kind of how to, to handle that in Boulder. Um, so they have different definitions for safe harbor hemp products and semi-synthetic, um, which I think would be, um, could be something that we wanted to look into. I know that in the past we talked about hemp and how to, how to handle some of the um, other, um, you know, psychoactive components that are, that are in the market that are, are um, not as regulated as, as um, THC. So just wanted to draw attention to, there were things in the presentation today that, that could have an impact that Boulder might want to take in a, a, a perspective on, but um, nothing, you know, nothing that I heard or saw that would be conflicting, you know, of, of um, you know, even the 40, 30 days is not really a conflicting thing, right? Boulder's allowed to be more restrictive. So there's no um, true conflict, in my opinion, there. Um, I do want to say that with hospitality, like their changes to consumption and hospitality things may change the way that we had presented a recommendation about hospitality. They talked about safe transportation requirements. They talked about a portion of the area for, you know, like for, um, you know, like uh, it has to be, some of it has to be consumed on site. They changed the limits to what people can purchase. Um, so I think that there are things that that are changing that could impact those things. But again, that's just, um, I was really happy with the presentation because, you know, all in all, I think there's no conflict, but there, there are things that we could potentially bring up as discussion points, but um, just wanted to see if anybody else did. Hey, Tom, I think you're muted um, if you were. You're right, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't want to um, move too soon. I, I was I was thinking there might be some more questions at the end, and so I tried to ask questions during. But... And Tom, I'm not suggesting that we reopen the conversation. I, I merely was just saying, if we're talking about, if you want to bring up a topic for next time, it could be a reflection of what we heard. <laughs> Um, or we could just, you know, people could continue to think about what they heard. And if anybody has a topic next time that we could bring it up at that point, I was just wanted to make a matters from the, the board, right? Um, was just this section. So I just wanted to bring it up. Okay. Maybe I'll use that as a segue to officially transition to agenda item nine. Any other matters from Brian, the vice chair, or other members of the board? Mm 
no articles were submitted. Sorry, y'all, no homework this month. Okay, well, then we might have an early meeting then. Early ending to the meeting, I should say. Okay, any motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Is Robin second on that? Brian seconds Robin's motion. Any opposition? And thank you to all, including new and existing staff and attorneys. Thanks for all that you do. Thanks to all the board members. Thanks, staff. Thank you, board. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, staff. Have a good month. Thank Thanks, you. Board. Bye. 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 Bye.